All right. Um, I usually like to give folks a little bit of time, but my screen looks different. So I, I can't see the um, attendees as they arrive. There's so, about, they're, they're still logging in. There's about 30, we're at about 32 now. Okay. Oh. I'll just do maybe one more minute and then we'll get started. Or I think we'll do one more minute and I'll last like 15 seconds. <laughs> and then, um, okay, great. Now I can see everyone. All righty. Well, welcome everyone. My name is Anna Truxis. I'm the executive director of the Portland Chinatown Museum. Thank you for joining us today um, for our artist talk with Lynn Yarn. Before we get started, uh, I would like to give a land acknowledgement. The Portland Chinatown Museum acknowledges and honors the indigenous peoples and their descendants of the Lower Columbia and Willamette River region whose lands the city of Portland and our museum currently occupy. These include Willamette, Tumwater, Clackamas, Kathlamet, Malala, Multnomah, and Lala Chinook tribes, and the Tualatin Kalapuya, who today are part of the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde, um, and the many other Chinookan peoples who established communities along the Lower Columbia, whose descendants today are members of the Grand Ronde, Warm Springs and Siletz Confederated Tribes of Oregon. Uh, before we get started, just a few things about today's event. We will be recording it as many of you have probably been informed as you arrived. Um, and um, we usually offer um, our online programming in a recorded fashion afterwards. So um, watch for that as well. But we are so excited to welcome back a good friend of the museum. Today, a local artist and educator, Lynn Yarn. Uh, some of you may remember her first talk with us last June, where she shared her personal creative journey and art practices with us, and also introduced the Leah Hing installation art project at the Portland building that she was just beginning then. Um, we also did a follow-up workshop that was truly gorgeous that's also available um, to, to view online. Today, she returns to our online community to share the progress of the installation along with some very special guests. So just to give some background on Lynn Yarn, she is an artist and teacher from Portland, Oregon. She works within animation and collage to address collective memory, generational narratives, histories, and space. A fifth and fourth generation Chinese and Japanese American, her current work explores themes of displacement and loss, resilience and community, particularly within Old Town Portland. She wonders about the capacity for art to engage and create stakeholders to actively involve people in repair and visionary thinking, which we were lucky enough to do with her last year as well. She is curious about participatory works, magic and rejuvenation. And I just wanna give a heartfelt welcome to you, Lynn. Thanks for being here again. Thanks for having me, Anna. Um, and thank you, my team of people who are here with me and everybody online. Um, I am, I have a cold, and so I stayed home. Um, I have some slides. Katvilani, would you help me project those slides? Thank you. Ooh. Um, so I'm Lynn Yarn. I'm here in my house. Um, this is kind of a virtual tour. Next slide, please. And so this is a picture of the physical installation of the Leah Hing mural. I started it last year, and then it's, I think I physically installed it in the springtime. Um, next slide, please. Because so many people helped me on this project, so it's very influenced by um, a lot of people's stories and a lot of people's research, all the resources at the Chinatown Museum, and then all the kind of legwork that happens um, to get to hear these stories. I thought the most appropriate way to present this mirror would be to include other people. And so think of this presentation or this mini tour as a micro presentation sandwich. Um, so again, thank you all the people who researched, all the people who um, did the legwork to make this happen. Next slide, please. All right, the physical mural is at the Portland building, so on Southwest Fifth Avenue, and it's in the Leah Hing Conference Room, which is open to the public as long as there isn't a meeting, is what my understanding is. And so here, oh, next slide, please. 
Here to speak from the conference room and from um, the Portland building is City Arts Program Manager, Jeff Hawthorne. Thank you, Lynn, and hello, everyone. My name is Jeff Hawthorne. I'm the Arts Program Manager for the City of Portland, and I am, in fact, coming to you from the Leah Hing Room on the first floor of the Portland building with Lynn's beautiful mural behind me. Um, my remarks are very brief. I just wanted to share some context for this room um, in which Lynn um, conducted her work. Um, many of you know that the Portland building was renovated in 2019, and um, one of the goals was to open up the first floor to host more uh, public events and, and more public activity. And in doing so, we created a few large meeting rooms, and there was a, a committee of city employees, including uh, employees in our employee resources groups, who um, had the task of coming up with names for some of these larger meeting areas. The goal being to celebrate um, some Portlanders that maybe weren't widely recognized yet in the city of Portland. And so that's how this room came to be named the Leah Hing Room. Um, this is a room that uh, can fit about 200 people. I'm going to pan around a little bit just so you can get a sense, maybe a little bit of what else is in the room. Um, but it, it does seat about 200 people. And it was actually designed with the possibility that in the future, this space would host future city council meetings. And because as many of you know, we just um, voted to change our system of government and we will be having 12 city councilors instead of five city commissioners, this room is very likely to be a place where city council will conduct some of its uh, business and city council meetings will be held in this building. Um, perhaps temporarily while City Hall is renovated to accommodate the larger council or maybe even permanently. So those decisions are yet to come, but uh, this is the Leah Hing room. Thank you so much, Lynn. Thank you, Jeff. And thanks for also physically being there to bring us to that space. Next slide, please. Um, so process was um, on the left side, that was my first kind of digital mock-up that I presented. And one of the, my favorite feedback pieces that I got was it looked kind of like a funeral or like an Asian funeral. And so on the right, I have an image of um, the funeral of Chik Nhat Han. Um, at first I was like, oh, that's kind of perfect. So like, I love Asian funeral party vibes. Um, I think they're really like ceremonial and memorial. And then it really caused me to think like, what is it that I'm trying to do with the Leah Hing mural? Um, is it a memorial piece? Is it uh, an honorific piece? Are those things similar? Are those things different? Um, when we're engaging with stories, especially the stories of people who've passed or people who are historical, um, what are we trying to get out of those stories? Are we teaching something? Um, are we just remembering something? And then I stole this question from Maggie Nelson. What is the relationship between storytelling and adaptation? Um, a lot of times I think it's assumed that we learn from history. And next slide, please. And thanks Capulani, who's always doing so much work in the background. <laughs> um, so as I was thinking about, you know, engaging with other people's stories and just public art in general, I kind of had like a mental mind map of different things that public art can do. I think a lot of times it beautifies spaces, but it also helps us form a relationship with that space. Um, and there also that history, that community. Next slide, please. Um, one of my most awesome advocates throughout this process was Morgan Ritter and Kristen Calhoun from Regional Arts and Culture Council. And so here to talk about um, RAC and public art is Morgan and Kristen. Right. needed to unmute us. Um. So, um, yeah, so we'll just introduce ourselves briefly. Uh, I'm Morgan Ritter and Kristen Calhoun. Right. We, <laughs> we are part of the public art program for the Regional mm -hmm. Arts and Culture Council. We are a partner with the city um, in the creation of public art. Uh, we 
manage all of the 2% for art. So when this building was renovated, there was a 2%. Um, and we did a number of different projects, one of which was for one of the other community rooms. And it so happened that the artists for that project um, decided to honor the, the name of, of the room. So that's the Lizzie Weeks room. So the artist, um, Kane Talton Davis did a piece that honors Lizzie Weeks along with other black women of that uh, mm -hmm. era. So that I think was a piece when originally the city had not wanted artwork in this room, but I think once it happened in the other room, it, it made sense for it to be here. So they asked us if we would help in the commissioning of new work. And Morgan did a lot of that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I was, um, my role was basically project manager uh, with support from Kristen. And um, a lot of my work is caring for and managing, um, stewarding the public art in the um, city and county art collection. So um, yeah, so this project is that percent for art commission and it's a relatively small wall that's like approximately 10 by 13 feet. Um, within this conference room in the newly renovated Portland building. And the piece conveys Leah's life, uh, you know, in these historic images and um, conveys her legacy in public space, which felt um, really important. And yeah, so at the project's inception, we began dialogue with the Portland Chinatown Museum. And so we started having conversations with Anna, who's here also, in um, who that who may be best to invite in the panel process. And we arrived at you know really inviting people from the elder community as well as new um, new voices in Chinatown and adjacent. So having that um, kind of uh, intersectional approach to supporting the art and so the panel was composed of six individuals many of them artists um, some city employee and um, community stakeholders people with lived experience in chinatown and um yeah so it's just it has been really great to see the project to fruition and um organize all of these amazing voices and share their feedback with Lynn and then see the, their relationships flourish even further beyond this project has been really beautiful as well. Um, so Lynn was selected for her storytelling, you know, abilities, her ability to combine that historic imagery with more like contemporary aesthetics and, um, and her personal connection to Leah Hing is really interesting. And like, I think kind of further increases the charge of um, the memorializing and the commemoration and celebration of her of her legacy. Added like po added power to it, I think. Also colorful, like a, it, it was. It's been really fascinating to hear Lynn's details that things that I couldn't research on my own. Details about Leah's life has been really amazing. Um, and this project just, you know, wanting to commemorate the past, but dreaming into the future. That has been really beautiful to see Lynn do in partnership with the Chinatown Museum, with the workshop she did last year, um, dreaming the future of Old Town. That's been an integral part in this work. And I've been interested in seeing the way that that's integrated in the visual, visual form and how it will continue to evolve with the augmented reality extra layer beyond even this physical, beautiful installation behind us. Do you have anything to add at this moment? No, you're, you're okay. covering, you're covering. <laughs> I'm just trying to try notes quickly, but um, yeah, we're just so grateful to advocate and support Lynn's vision um, and her practice and yeah, I'm just, I'm glad to see such an imaginative work in a political space and see the power of that. Um, Lynn, I've heard you talk about it too, like in the way this is where policy is written and it's just 
really beautiful to see this presence of Chinatown within that within that sort of space. So we're I just want to end by saying um, we've been working on planning a public celebration for all of the art installations in the Portland building. So stay tuned. You can follow um, Regional Arts Instagram and um, I'm not sure the city Instagram, but yeah, but we're working towards um, doing that public celebration. So there'll be another opportunity to hopefully come together in physical form and celebrate. Hopefully in the fall. Yes. Do you want to turn on your speakers since mine are out? All right, that's it. I think um, unless Kristen, do you want to add anything else? No. Lynn, you're Lynn, muted. No, she's not. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Kristen and Morgan. Um, I really appreciate the care that you take to reach out to so many different types of people and to really thoughtfully engage in that process and the advocacy work you guys have done to let me kind of take my time to explore all my meanderings in my head. And um, so that's, I feel very lucky to have worked with you guys. Um, next slide, please. Um, so I thought next we'd kind of go through different parts of the mural and then have our micro presentation sandwiches. Next slide, please. So in the middle um, are stories about Leah through small vignettes. Next slide, please. In my last talk, I talked a little bit about how I was inspired by this wooden chest that my grandmother had, and it had all these kind of like little stories carved into it or imagined stories. Um, so I took that idea and then I used photographs and stories that were told about Leah's life um, and then tried to kind of carve them in a similar fashion, like a little bit stylized. Um, there's kind of some nature items and then a photo of Leah in the middle. Next slide, please. Um, Leah is most well known for being the first Chinese American woman pilot or a person to get her pilot's license. Um, so he, next slide, please. Um, here from the National Park Service Museum, or she is the National Park Service Museum curator at the Fort Vancouver National Historic Site, which is located in Vancouver, Washington and Oregon City. Um, welcome Megan Huff. Thank you. And I have some slides to share. Is it okay that you do that? Okay. All right, so you're seeing that now. Good, all right. Well, thank you so much for having me today. Um, as Lynn said, I am a museum curator for the National Park Service at Port Vancouver National Historic Site which is located just north of you in Vancouver, Washington. And we also have a location in Oregon City, Oregon. And I'm here today to just share how we tell uh, Leah's story at Pearson Air Museum. Pearson Air Museum is located in Vancouver and it tells the story of Pearson Field, which is one of the country's oldest continuously operating airfields. It was dedicated in 1925. And in the 1930s, Pearson Field was a popular civilian airfield, and one of the pilots who used this airfield was Leah King. Oops, there we go. All right. So today, Leah's story is told in a panel um, inside the museum's gallery, as well as in interpretive programs and on the National Historic Sites website. And last fall, Leah's 1931 Fleet Model 7 biplane was donated, donated to the Fort Vancouver National Historic Site Museum collection. And since then, her aircraft has been on permanent display inside the museum. According to Leah's flight instructor, Tex Rankin, she was a natural at flying. And like other early aviators, Leah became a bit famous and was featured in some newspaper articles at the time. The New York Post star called her the Chinese Miss Lindy after world famous aviator Charles Lindbergh. In interviews, she told reporters that she dreamed of a future where more women, and specifically more Chinese women, would learn to fly. In 1932, she told the Oregonian that she believed, quote, women can learn to fly just as easily as men. And eventually there will be as 
just as many women flying as men. In 1934, she received her pilot's license, number 2741, making her the first US born Chinese American woman to earn her pilot's license. And in 1936, she purchased this two seater biplane from the Chinese Aeronautic Association of America and housed it in a hangar at Pearson Field. Following the end of her flying career in the 1940s, Leah became an advocate for members of Portland's Chinese community seeking American citizenship. And we hope Leah will be proud to know that the same air museum where her aircraft is now on display has been host to annual citizenship ceremonies for several years now. Every September, the National Park Service partners with US Citizenship and Immigration Services to host these ceremonies. And at future ceremonies, new American citizens will have the opportunity to learn about Leah's story in the museum. Leah's story does not stand alone at this National Historic Site. We also steward and share with the public stories of Chinese Americans who lived and worked here like Chin Wei and Louis Lee. We hope to inspire the next generation of park stewards who will continue to learn from, discover, and share these stories here. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Megan. Um, I was especially touched about the ceremonies that are held. Absolutely, those are, it, we're very excited to be able to have her aircraft here and bring those to new audiences in September when we do those ceremonies. Awesome. Um, Capulani, will you help project the slides again? Thank you, and next slide, please. Um, so I think there's a lot of aspects of Leo's life that I think she has an awesome tagline, like first Chinese American, um, female pilot, but also there's a lot of aspects of her life that are so inspiring, interesting, um, that I don't think are widely known. Um, I think as Megan mentioned, her, her work towards helping people get citizenship, especially the Chinese community, um, people who sometimes didn't speak English and trying, were trying to navigate the citizenship process. Um, next slide, please. Um, she traveled in a band, an all Chinese American female band um, in the 1920s. So I think she was in her late teens, early 20s. Um, they played one song, but thinking about, you know, what time period that was, that wasn't even a time when jazz was like widely accepted in popular culture as like a mainstream form of music. Um, and if, you know, if you think about like riot girl bands, um, how how awesome in that time period. Um, you can see Leah with the saxophone on the right hand side. Next slide, please. Um, I think the part that is, that I feel like is most missing from her story um, and the tellings of her story are, if you talk to any person that knew her um, throughout her life, they always mention Tiny. Next slide, please. Um, so Tiny was her life partner or Lil um, and I don't think she's often told as a, a queer hero, um, but she was an out queer woman throughout her whole lifetime. Next slide, please. And Lee and Lil lived together, you know, until they were older. And it's just a really lovely part of their story. Next slide, please. Um, they had two houses that were identical and right next to each other. And as my dad told it or has mythologized it to me, um, one was the one that they lived in and one was for all of their stuff from their kind of lifelong um, journeys and travels and interesting lives. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Um, here's some, with some remarks about uh, Leah is Patsy Fong Lee. And you know, the first time I met Patsy Fong Lee as an adult, I was at my cousin's wedding and there was someone on the dance floor who outlasted me and it was Patsy, who's an awesome just person, historian and knowledgeable, just great person to know. Thank you, Patsy. Oh, passing the mic to you, Patsy. One. Take it away, Patsy. Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, 
the reason I know Leah is because my mother was a good friend of Leah's parents. And she used to go to Leah's house where the parents lived to visit. And that's how I got to know Leah a little bit. But um, Leah is one of these people that is so, uh, she, she loves to delve into uh, new things. She was into photography. She was into watchmaking. She uh, loved to venture with her friend, Lil. They went to Yellowstone one year with a old car in those days and uh, without even knowing where, which direction they were going, they just went. And uh, on the way, their car broke down and she managed to fix the car to keep going. She's one of these adventurous people and she is a very interesting person to talk to. That's why um, my mother and I visited her quite often. But the story is my mother did not speak English, but when she got her American citizenship, Leah was the one that helped her. She got her started by uh, knowing who the president was and things that uh, they would ask questions. And because she didn't speak English, she only was uh, knowledgeable about the president and what they think that she would be asked. So she did get her American citizenship when she was in her uh, early 80s. So she was just so pleased when she became an American citizen. Um, Leah is one of these people that you just kind of gravitate to because she has so many interesting stories, especially uh, with her group of girlfriends in her early period where they played a band. They only knew one piece of music and it was Happy Days Are Here Again. And so when they did kind of travel, that's all they played. I thought that was great. Um, she is a very memorable person. You will never forget her because she uh, was so knowledgeable. She and Tiny were lifelong uh, partners. And I think that yeah, they had a partnership that they grew old together. And that was one of the best things for her and Lil. Um, my mother really liked Leah because my mother knew the parents when they were had a hop farm and it was easy for my mother to walk over to visit Leah whenever she felt like it. And I also brought my first child, second child, often to visit them too, because I learned so much from them. That's thank it. <laughs> thank you so much, Patsy. Um, when I had a chance to sit down with Patsy, when I had asked her if there was a certain word or kind of term that she might use to describe Leah's legacy, and something that struck me was she was saying like, Pioneer wasn't quite the right word because pioneer kind of feels a little older, whereas Patsy was saying that her legacy and her story is so current, um, so relevant today. So, thank you, Patsy. Thank you. All right, next slide, please. Um, so the kind of main panel in the center of the mural is about Leah and her stories. Um, there are four, they're supposed to be kind of cloud, amorphous cloud-like shapes. Um, there are four other wooden pieces that surround Leah's panel. Next slide, please. Um, I've been thinking of them kind of like an emotional version of Chinatown. And as, you know, our Chinatown's a little bit in 
trouble or it's kind of going through a thing. Um, but I think a lot of places around the country, Chinatowns around the country are um, changing or kind of thinking about what is the importance of Chinatown? What is Chinatown? Um, I think similarly, to things I think that public art can do. Um, for me, Chinatown does a lot of things that public art does. Like, is Chinatown a public art piece? Um, is it something that's, you know, teaching a story? Are we remembering things? Um, next slide, please. I think for me, there's a lot of stories within Chinatown, um, especially an old town more generally, um, where we think about communities of color who, and, and queer communities, um, that were excluded from a lot of the city, but found community, found um, family, found ways to be with one another. Um, and I think that's maybe those stories, I wanted to think about how they're physically present besides just signage. Next slide, please. Um, so the Hung Far Low sign, I think is one of the biggest icons in Chinatown besides the gate. Um, and it comes with a little bit of like, because it's a little like keep Portland weird, it's a little kitschy, but you know, tracking, talking to Jackie Peterson Loomis, um, she has so many interesting things to say about Hung Far Low and the legacy of um, an influence that are brought to chefs like James Beard, you know, considered the father of American cooking. Um, so I, I, you know, I thought about all those stories and how, um, how emotional Chinatown is for me and for many people. Um, so other kind of things I have in the mural, um, if you've ever been to Golden Horse, I know a lot of you have, and you get that tomato beef curry chow mein with Gary's noodles, very particular. Um, I really wanted that in there. Um, when I was little, I remember going to Fong Chong and then afterwards really looking forward to my grandma would buy me hot flakes at the store next door. Next slide, please. Um, I thought a lot about what does it mean to have all these signages and um, storefronts, but maybe with less people and less um, community members. Um, so I really wanted to put people in the mural. And I think my memories of like eating around a big table and um, just restaurants and spaces that are built for a round table where everyone's sharing a meal together, sometimes intergenerationally, um, is really special. Um, that's me on the very top right, and you can see Leah and Lil on the bottom right next to my grandma. Next slide, please. Um, I thought about buildings and sites that are still physically there, and in the very top of the mural is Tuck Lung, and kind of a copied version of Roberta, Roberta Wong's art piece. Uh, next slide, please. And so um, Roberta is someone that I just want to be part of every single project that I do because I just love her, her voice in whatever I'm thinking about. I'm here to talk about art and talk along and uh, what she does is Roberta Wong. Hi, thank you, Lynn. Again, thanks for inviting me to be a panelist and also for including Tuck Lung in your design for the mural. Uh, before I begin with that, though, I did want to share a little Leah Hing story that I have. Uh, back in the late 80s, I produced a traveling exhibit from uh, that I brought up from San Francisco, and it was an exhibit, uh, traveling exhibit called uh, Chinese Women in America. And Leah was one of those women that was featured in the book and also in the exhibit. So I asked Leah if she would like to contribute uh, something to the exhibit. And she honored us with the display of her, her little helmet and her goggles for that exhibit. So again, uh, it, it was definitely a nice exchange. Uh, regarding tuck lungs, Tuck Lung is a grocery business that was started by my grandfather, Sun Yuk Wong. And his backstory was that uh, his father was here in the United States as a camp cook in Northern California for the gold miners. And he returned to China in 1920, um, ill and unfortunately died later that year. So my grandfather as the only son was obligated to take his place and uh, go to America and be the um, 
be able to support the family from afar. So um, he left his wife and the five children. And my dad was only six at the time. And um, he, at the time, was working also as a manager of a fabric store in, in, in a village in Toysan. Um, so when he arrived here in the US, it was 1920, the same year his father passed away and really didn't have any time to, uh, uh, to prepare leaving his family and his life in China. Uh, but he did get a, uh, a photograph of his family before he left um, to uh, have as his memento. Um, so um, when he arrived in the US, he joined in partnership with other uh, men to operate a grocery store. And by 1930, he bought out his partners and began Tuck Lung as a sole proprietor. And that was the beginning of a multi-generational business that closed in 2003. And the name Tuck Lung um, comes in part from his name. So in China, men are given two names, uh, a formal name and an informal name. And his alias was Tuck or in, in Toi Sanwa, it's uh, Atlung. And um, uh, so the characters, which I think is the first slide um, of the originals, their original sign, it's a vertical banner. So there's more characters on that uh, sign, but um, the first two characters, Atlung was the name of the business. And you can see the hinges up there, so it probably hang vertically outside the shop. Um, those characters, however, was what I used to model uh, the, the sign that I created. Um, I think in the next slide you can see. And so this is uh, carved out of Philippine mahogany. It's two uh, panels. It's laminated, um, maybe three panels. Uh, side by side, and then face uh, sandwiched to two panels as well. So uh, it's about two layers thick, maybe about five inches thick. Um, and it was inserted into, I made two of them. So one is inserted on the end of the building on 4th Avenue, and the other is inserted on the end of the building on Davis Street. And uh, when the building sold, these signs were sold as part of the building. So they're still there. Uh, they haven't been oiled for decades. So unfortunately the conditions are very uh, sad to see. Uh, the Davis Street faces the sun. And, um, but thankfully, again, there hasn't been a, any major vandalism to the pieces. Um, um, the glass did get broken once, but uh, Again, that was with uh, without repair, disrepair to the the wood piece itself. Um, so I just wanted to share that uh, currently uh, there is a pop up exhibit at the Portland Chinatown Museum that tells the story of this multi generational business in Chinatown, and uh, it should be up by the end of this month and with the possibility of extension. So. Hopefully you can learn more about that uh, family history. So thank you, Lynn. Thanks, Roberta. Mm -hmm. um, when I first talked to Roberta and I was trying to you know, get some feedback on the mural process and she was one of the people who recommended, um, Leah was a very smiley person. And so I remember Roberta, you had said like, maybe a less serious photo than that kind of stoic pilot photo. Um, so I really liked that idea and I think it helped me kind of change the forms to lighten it up a little bit in general. Um, I thought a lot about in this process, um, what it means to have these stories present in a room where public policy is made and a lot of the decisions about Portland is made. Um, you know, not saying that my piece is going to sway public opinions, but I think for 
me having these stories present and stories like Roberta's um, present in that space is very meaningful, especially as that space is sometimes ignored or Chinatown space is sometimes ignored. Um, I also thought about when monuments or public artworks are created, do they have to, do old things stay old and how do I um, have opportunity to keep it current or, you know, things change. Um, so the next phase is an augmented reality overlay. Um, when you scan Leah's picture, the your phone will populate with clouds. Next slide, please. I'm still working on making them fluffier. Um, uh, Linda, do you want me to play the video? Oh, sure. I was hoping it would loop. So that was just kind of an example of like one of my testers. Actually, the cloud is very shiny. Next slide, please. Um, so there are several metal plaques throughout the mural, um, which you can scan by phone for an augmented reality overlay. So when you have your phone in front of you, you'll be able to see images um, and different content. Um, and it will, I'm hoping that it creates a different real-time experience of the mural. Next slide, please. Um, so one AR element that will be present will be archives, photos, animations. So um, actual images of Leah, possibly articles, um, links. Next slide, please. Another element will be augmented reality dioramas. Kind of, I really like the kind of look and feel of like almost like a paper dollhouse. Um, in the summer of last year at the Portland Chinatown Museum, I had a really awesome group of people come together um, to envision what future Chinatown could look like. And so thinking about um, how do we want our history and these, uh, these legacies to inform the future of Chinatown um, and what would that look like? Next slide, please. And so the findings of the, or not findings, but the um, kind of recordings and ideas brought out in the workshop will become small dioramas that will be present inside the mural. Next slide, please. Um, AR element number three will be to connect to the awesome work that um, Capiolani, Anna and Sarah are doing and others are doing at the Chinatown Museum. Cause I think there's so much really cool work that I just want to connect to and I think would be great to be part of the mural. Um, next slide, please. And so up next is Kapiolani Lee from the Portland Chinatown Museum. Hi everyone. Um, just to give a little uh, background into our Chinatown Live project. Um, the Portland Chinatown History Foundation, which runs the museum, has been building um, and digitizing a collection of more than 40 oral histories since 2000. And we've been working on sharing some of these um, oral histories with the public through a project called Chinatown Live, uh, which we hope will serve as a, a powerful resource for um, learning and engaging with Portland Chinatown history through personal stories. And so we're really excited to announce um, phase two of the Chinatown Live project, which we'll be launching at the end of this month, which will um, have a lot more excerpts from oral histories um, that really highlight the beautiful diversity um, of the Portland Chinatown community. So we hope that you will uh, check out the website to see uh, if there are any updates um, on the, sorry, my dog is on the lanai. <laughs> Barking at a neighbor dog um, to, uh, and, and our upcoming summer newsletter will mention uh, details about how to access phase two. So um, we're very excited to share more of what we've been um, working on. Thank you, Kapiolani. Um, also at the Chinatown Live site, you can read more about Patsy Fong Lee's story. Um, so another connection within our presentation. Next slide, please. Um, 
So again, there were so many people who were part of this project in one way or another, whether it's telling me stories or you know the physical work of helping me hang stuff or derive stuff or um, fabricate or advocate. Um, so thank you to all my presenters. I've, I'm really excited about all the stories that you shared. Um, and thank you all for everyone who logged on and took time to be here. Thank you, Lynn. Thanks, Patsy. Thank you. That was wonderful. Um, I want to check and see if we have anything in the uh, the Q and A. It's not showing up on my screen, but um, that doesn't mean that uh, we don't have it. But I also, your presentation was so thought provoking. I I have so many questions I want to ask you about the aesthetics of the project and just about the collaboration that you've shown was so um, extensive. Okay, um, so I'm gonna actually start with, oh, I see a question just popped up. Um, oh, Shuju says, uh, I love how buoyant the mural looks and feels. And uh, Lynn, correct me if I'm wrong, but you and Shuju also worked on a mural project together. Is that correct? Yeah. Oh my gosh, Shuju's the best. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so many great people in my life and she's just been working really hard as I've been kind of like struggling through this end of the school year um she's been making files and she's like very detail oriented in ways that I'm not so um just very excited about everything she do well hopefully we'll be able to host both of you to talk about that project too that looks really interesting um but I really want to ask you about and this is you know because I'm an art historian so I apologize for kind of you know, nerding out on this, but the juxtaposition between the materials. And I saw this, you know, I saw on Facebook, you posted that the carving connected with like a period in your life where you were doing carving and how it also connects to the, you know, the family heirloom and how this moment when you were doing carving, you know, you didn't think it would kind of necessarily culminate in a project like this. And I was struck by the juxtaposition between the wood carving and then the AR, the very technical. So the multi-generational is kind of visual and physical in your work. And I just wanted to hear you kind of talk a bit about that, maybe riff on that, um, that combination. Um, thank you. Um, I think you're referring to, I used to oil iPhone cases in my garage for about three years as kind of a side job. And I was really behind on all my movie watching. So it helped me kind of catch up on a lot of shows and movies that I'd never seen. Um, but it was like about, I think it was about 12 cents a case. Um, and I, you know, it, it panned out to about minimum wage. It wasn't like a terrible job or business by any means. Um, but I, I do think it's interesting just process was the kind of uh, all the things we do in our life that we use later down the road or the stories that we hear and you know they come up again. Um, I thought that carving wood, I, it was, I made it out of clay and then it was fabricated and then I kind of detailed it. So I didn't like carve it from scratch in the way that maybe Roberta did. So I'm kind of curious about Roberta's process. Um, I'm curious about like I really liked the time and engagement that it takes with the material. Um, Roberta, I was curious for you, why did you choose wood for your pieces, especially an exterior piece? Um, um, basically, um, I had the opportunity um, to work uh, in the studio of Leroy Setzels and he's a well-known wood carver. And uh, he was also the a family friend. His wife, Ruth, was our Sunday school teacher at the Chinese Presbyterian Church. And I remember uh, this was when it was located on, South, uh, on Northwest Third Avenue. And they had a sunken garden that um, was extended to Fourth Avenue. So it was a long, narrow piece of property but the property also included a parking lot, which was on the corner of 4th and Davis. And uh, we would access the Sunday school through that parking lot into the sunken garden and into the building. And uh, on occasion, Mr. Setzel would come visit. And at that time he was a sea merchant. And whenever he came, the kids would always line up in front of him and he would toss us up in the air and, 
you'd run out and run back to the back of the line and wait for another opportunity to, to get thrown up in the air. So uh, again, just very fond memories of that time. And um, uh, so again, with this relationship with Mr. Setzel, uh, he came in, um, he, he would come in often uh, when he was in town to buy groceries and he himself was very uh, uh, fine cook and loved to cook stir fried and and eventually would be growing his own bok choy on his property out in Sher Sher Sheridan. But um, during that time, uh, my brother was in the process of building, uh, going, uh, beginning the process of building this the new Tuklang. And Mr. Setzel came in and uh, uh, shared with him that I'd be doing a project for the new building. And he insisted that I'd use his studio space to do that. So his studio at the time was in Laird Hill, which was uh, in um, off of Corbett. And uh, so every day after uh, work, I would go down to his studio and uh, work in this it's an old Victorian house that was pretty much gutted and, and that he had as a studio space. And, and uh, it was just a, a, a pleasure to work with him. He would uh, sing his opera and as you're working and uh, he, he always liked to tease as well. And we, uh, I showed him my first wood piece and he says, uh, and it was, piece that I finished using sandpaper and he comes to, he he approaches my piece and says uh he shows me how I should finish it and he takes his chisel and he gouges out a piece so that's how you <laughs> that's how you finish a piece and again implementing you know a sharp tool is is the only thing you need uh, to have a clean finish so I never use sandpaper again after that but um it was a good lesson and um and again, so he he was a great person uh, to know at that time, and 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 uh, in part, um, and working in wood is is because of him. But you know, I always wanted to to work in wood. Uh, actually, I I thought of that as my what I would be doing um, um, following school is to have a wood studio studio. Um, but I. Uh, uh, I, I should not take any more time to take a tangent, but uh, that's what I thought I was going to be doing at the time. Well, Roberta, everyone is uh, what really appreciated that. So don't don't feel like um, don't feel bad. There were comments in the chat and Q and A thanking you for the great story, and I was just imagining all the places you were talking about as you wove that. Um, that tale for us and we know these works of art by Roberta are right next to the museum we see them every day we wish that we could um maybe help steward them <laughs> a bit better uh for the um property owner so and they're so beautiful and Lynn the way you included them was wonderful we have some activity in the chat that I wanted to just let y'all know about um Kim Ogawa says beautiful beautifully concepted and designed with a modern approach Thank you for showing us the installation because the scale is much bigger than photos indicate. Enjoyed the personal story um, as well, it looks like. And then an anonymous attendee says, thank you so much, Lynn. How are you related to Leah Hing again? Um, Leah was my grandmother's cousin, which I just call great auntie. Yeah, auntie. <laughs> there was a, there was a very... Yeah, there was a great um, cousin and auntie and uncle chart that went around TikTok that I loved. Um, yeah, and then one more person says, um, an anonymous attendee says, do you have more insight as to what Leah and Lil, and I'm sure of spelling, uh, Lil's life was like together as life partners? It's so exciting to learn about more queer Asian elders. And I have to agree, it is a really important part of the story that you often don't hear. Yeah. I don't have as much insight as maybe other people on the panel might. Um, I don't know if anyone else wants to respond to that or people in the chat. I'm Patsy Lee. Uh, as long as I've known Leah, uh, 
they were lifelong partners. She just was there and they were just uh, partners, Not, nothing else. They were great together and she did whatever uh, Leah wanted to do. If they have a party, she agreed to it. She, she was a very agreeable person as far as I, I know. But other than that, I don't know any more about it, you know, about their partnership. It's just that they were together and we all didn't even think about anything else, you know, how it is today. But it, it, it just never dawned on me that it was unusual. Well, and Patsy, I loved what you said in your presentation that um, that they had that partners for life thing that is so enviable and, you know, to grow old together is such an enviable thing. So, yeah. yeah. And That's you also, true. Patsy, have really lovely comments in the chat I want to tell you about. Um, there's a hi, Auntie Patsy, and a great job telling your stories about Leah from Carolyn Lee. Um, more more props to everybody on the panel. Um, and uh, oh, and then Shuju uh, shares that she's always loved the Tuck Lung songs, uh, signs as well. So thank um, you. Yeah, thank you. I think oh. Patsy could have her own mural because you have a very interesting story too, Patsy. Um, um not really interesting. <laughs> Very interesting. <laughs> um, well, we have some I'm of just them. very fortunate. Yes. Um, there are a couple more questions in the chat. Um, so Julie Che asks, is let's see here, can you modify and change the AR portions of the installation as much as you want? If so, how often do you plan to change or swap out the R sections? I absolutely love this. And then the follow-up, how often and how will you decide what to use as content for the augmented reality sections? Um, I think that as far as my kind of testing can go, that I can change things out. Um, but I think the most live part will be the connection to the Chinatown Live section with the Chinatown Museum. Um, so I'm like super excited about that content and I think the timing is great. Um, I think there's eight or nine different metal plaques, which doesn't mean I just choose eight or nine different things, um, but I think I'll try and curate it specifically to what it's overlaying and the surrounding areas. For example, um, we haven't really talked about it, but if I had like an interview with Roberta that was connected to, you know, right next to the Tuck Lung sign. Um, I see a question from my mom in the chat. Um, do you know the other individuals that are featured in the artwork in the Portland building? And this might be a great question for Kristen Morgan or Jeff. I will take that one. Um, so the, the, in the Lizzie Weeks room, um, Lizzie Weeks is featured and she was a, a midwife uh, who lived and worked in Portland and who also was a female rights advocate, women's rights advocate. Um, Beatrice Morrill Kennedy is in that, uh, one of the first lawyers uh, in, in black lawyers, black female lawyers in Portland. Um, Thelma Street, uh, who was internationally known as a dancer and performer, maybe known internationally better than in Portland, but was in Portland. Um, and then there are a few other individuals who are um, who were related to the artist who did that piece. So kind of nice that both of these um, pieces have some family history in them as well. And um, Lynn, I just, I, I'm so grateful for your um, depth and generosity with how you've approached this work. And it's been such a joy to work with you. Likewise, I have a lot of respect for what you guys do at Rex. Okay, sorry, I was just catching up on chats, I think. I, I was trying to read two windows. So I think we got everything and, and um, I wanna make sure that we have enough time to thank everyone that participated. Um, it was such a pleasure to hear all the angles of this project and, um, and to, to kind of get an inside peek into the process and 
also to hear the good news that there there is uh, hopefully a planned um, public opening. Um, and I see more more things are going in the chat, so please check them out. I just want to make sure I respect everyone's time and um, get our thank yous in. So thank you so much for joining us today. If you enjoyed today's program, uh, we will be posting a recording of our live talk on our website at www.portlandchinatownmuseum.org. Um, we've all, we will also invite you to stop by the museum to see our latest exhibition, uh, Bu Qi, curated by Roberta Wong. She's uh, done two really important exhibitions for us. This one could truly be a landmark in this artist's career. So please check it out. Um, and again, thank you so much, Lynn, for sharing your vision and your time with us and, and letting us see the collaboration that unfolded as a part of this project. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Hi. Thanks. Hi. Thank Feel you. Feel better too. Yes. I feel bad. I hope I got, I, I feel like maybe some missed, but they were coming in so fast at the end. So I didn't see a couple of them. Lots of thank yous, Lynn. Oh, thank you guys so much. And thank you for, you know, the ongoing support that you have offered.